Hey everybody. So today on Vulnerable, I get to speak with author, former actor from Mrs. Doubtfire and Independence Day. She's also the founder and CEO of Blue Mala and Mission Flexible. Um, her focus is entirely on mental health, yoga, and mindfulness practices, and she is a wonderful human being. Today I get to speak with Lisa Jacob. Well, I am so happy to be here in, um, well, it's my new home, um, and it's a little different, different looking and different feeling, and all of the stress and anxiety that comes with that. And so today it seems like it would be the perfect person for me to chat with, um, and I'm really excited to welcome Lisa Jacob here on Vulnerable. Hi, Lisa. Christy, I'm so I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you for oh, inviting me. That really touches my heart because um, we got to meet at the '90s con um, when I was also anxiously hosting. Uh, it seems like <laughs> these are this seems Were to be an anxious thing. I was. Were you anxious I, doing that? I I was hosting my first ever um, like job of uh, hosting all these amazing people I looked up to when I was a kid, right? Because I'm a nine, I'm an 84 slash 90s, you know, baby. So yeah. uh, we have Nick Carter, we have yourself and Mara and Maddie. And when we have like Hocus Pocus reunions happening and Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and then like I'm there. And then like, they'll tell me something like, um, I always had to budget for about an hour of chatting with everyone for the panels and then like they came in five minutes before for uh what, what panel was that um a uh, full house and they were like Ooh. you've only got a half hour and i was like you my goodness it was like right before we're going on so you have that's to like half a house that's not a full house that's a half a house you can do in, in 30 minutes oh my god thank you yeah so i mean <laughs> I, ultimately what mattered to me was that you guys felt comfortable and pulling away from that experience. So I, I threw myself into you guys, which is the job, right? Instead yeah. of trying to entertain everyone else and satisfy everyone's questions or... Anyway, I learned a lot. And um, it was really a really great experience to meet you. And you know, I know Mara, she's a friend of sort of mine and been in a lot of content that I've done. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that was that was the first time we had ever met. And I just thought you were like the coolest thing ever. <laughs> I mean, you seemed so on top of it. You did not seem anxious at all. And uh, and so I'm I mean, I'm, I'm surprised to, to hear that you were anxious. And I'm going to say oh. this. Um, oh, please do. And I. I and I, I hope that you you take this in the spirit that it is intended, because I hope you take it the way that I take it when people say this to me, um, which is, I, I, I loved meeting you at 90s Con, and I was so excited to hang out there, and then so excited to do this podcast with you. And so I was like looking you up and looking uh -huh. at your various you know channels and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Because I have never seen a single thing that you have done as an actor. Oh, okay. That's fine. I've never seen any of it. No, but and that's so fine. <laughs> it's great, I think, because yeah. I love it when people say to me, like, I've never seen Doubtfire. I've never seen yes. Independence Day. And I'm like, thank yes. God. Yes. Yes. Like, my husband. Let's... My husband had no idea who I was. And it's really great and, and I actually that's such a great share um it really no I really it's that's amazing thank you because, because we can just start on this like clean authentic slate level. right I, well, I don't there's that have... and also you not pretending like you that's amazing thank you that's awesome <laughs> I however saw my face in you because you you were this you were this girl with these big brown eyes and this brown hair. And so like when I saw Mrs. Doubtfire, I saw myself in you. So like, um, I don't know, it's not as if I felt represented, but I mean, I did in that I was yeah. like, wow, like look at her, she's making movies and she's so composed. And like, there was a little bit of Ren Stevens, which is a character I played in Disney, in it, like your character kind of inspired me, I think, in some of my my archetypes. Wow. In somewhere there <laughs> was every '90s girl, older big sister archetype. You know, so amazing. 
Yeah. That's so fantastic. But Isn't I'm just it? always, you know, it, it's so funny because those of us who who grew up on screen, we are so accustomed to having people have this image of us or who we we are because they saw us on screen. And so it's um I think it's just amazing and I love that your husband didn't didn't know anything that you were in like to be able to to be so present with someone rather than thinking of them when they were 14, which would have been mm-hmm. particularly creepy for your husband. But you know, to, to, have, <laughs> to, to have this, this ability to, to be really present with someone and just um, take them for, for who they are now, I think is such a, a beautiful thing. Well, and also, um, you make a really amazing point, and I think there's gonna be so many amazing points in talking to you. I can see that and feel that coming from your energy. Um, like there's a huge split in, 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 and then that splits in many different splits, if you know what I'm saying. So like first there's you, then there's how people see you. And then that becomes sort of like a, a hydra, you know, because then it's like, okay, well, I don't see myself that way. Well, how do I see myself? And then there's all the other narratives that go into that. Um, which can be, a lot of times they can be very dangerous, which by the way, you have a wonderful talk on YouTube that I would encourage everyone to go and listen to. And it's talking about Lisa's um, experience with some anxiety and bouts of depression. And I don't know about it, you, but like I can very, very much relate to all of it. And I would love to get into that and sort of just, I guess how you've come to know yourself regardless mm. of your your career milestones but like regardless of those milestones how have you come to be so self actualized oh yeah. it's a long it's a long road it's, and we're let's do it <laughs> yeah and i mean that's something i think that's something that a lot of us are working on right and i think it's 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 a work in progress because we're always changing and who we are and who we want to be and what we want our lives to mean i think changes so much and it's okay for that to change and so i think it's all about um being really honest about that and asking those questions of yourself and being okay with not knowing the answer Hmm. And that's a really tricky part because I'm one of those people who like, I just, I want there to be a clear path, you know, I want there to be an easy answer. Why can't everyone just get on board with that? (laughs) And it just doesn't work that way. So I think, you know, being able to separate, uh, for me anyway, this was huge, being able to separate what I wanted from what other people expected of me. And of that was something that that took a long time and and was was very painful for me, but I I think that's a, a you know a continual question that that we all need to be looking at. Yeah, and I think that it can also be considered like when you're this this brand this um, public person, you feel unique. Um, so you you think that this is really only occurring to you and people that might be in your similar situation. But what I think is really great about the current state of people discussing mental health um, and their awareness, this like sort of this consciousness that's been raised by social media and and folks like yourself really having platforms to discuss this stuff and spread the word out. I think that people realize that they're not unique, you know, and that everyone can kind of come together and try to understand what they're going through. Yeah, it's literally why I titled my second book, Not Just Me, because Mm -hmm. I was literally in that position where I just thought I was so incredibly special with my anxiety. I just had this mind that was wilder than anybody else's mind. And sure, meditation might work for you, but I am I am deeply unique in how fucked up I am. Mm-hmm, and so none of your nice little solutions are gonna work for me, right? Um, and I think when I when I got over some of the ego of that yeah. and realized that 
oh my God, so many of us are dealing with this stuff. We're just not talking about it. Um, it, it knocked me down a few pegs in a wonderful way because then I realized I did not have to do this by myself. Oh my gosh. So let's start at the beginning then um, because it is, it is a road that many people find daunting to even think about starting. And so many people that may be listening today may be thinking to themselves, well, I'm just getting, I just get sad now and then. Well, I just have, you know, I just have trauma from when I was a kid or I just have like things that I don't, I can cope, you know, by doing the things I do or (laughs) detaching or what is it, (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. disassociating and all that stuff. But it's like, there's other ways, right? And, and, And sort of what I've, what I've come to realize now, by the way, is that I started EMDR and it really blew the top off of a lot of things for me. And it's, I'm actually thinking about taking a break from it just for my personal life. Like it it almost is like there's certain roads that once you go down them, you need to have certain infrastructure and you have to know that, you know, there's a net to catch you. And Mm -hmm. um, so I want to get into it because it's not all very clean. It's not linear. Mental health is definitely not linear. Like just because you found the vocab doesn't mean that you found what's going to work for you per se. So let's just go back to when you started feeling and understanding that you had like the anxiety and the depression that you were kind of suffering from that, if you don't mind. Uh, Not at all. Okay. So I was always an anxious kid. I was a worrier, just that, that was just baked into who I am to a certain extent. And then um, you know, you, you, you put the film industry on top of that and it just makes this amazing mess. So I, I remember having my first panic attack at age 11 on the set of Night Court. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, I was like a huge fan of Night Court and so, so excited I. to be on that show. Huge fan and of then. That show. I had a panic attack because it was in front of a live audience and I had Mm. never done that before. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I was 11 at that point. I had been a working actor since I was four. I was seasoned in my own opinion, right? Like this was going to be fine. (laughs) And uh, yeah, the the live studio audience really threw me off. And uh, there I was at 11 going, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack. I am about to die. Wow. Um, and and so that was sort of the beginning of me officially going, oh, this is more than I just worry about stuff. This mm-hmm. feels big. And so um, I have anxiety, I have occasional depression, and, and I have this panic disorder. Mm-hmm. And so it has been... Um, at times manageable, at times completely unmanageable. But as you said, it's not linear. Not linear. It sort of comes and goes. Yeah. I uh, am a huge fan of therapy. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy specifically is what has worked well for me. Mm-hmm. And then when I was, I guess, in my... Um, in my late teens and early 20s is when it started to get really, really bad. It okay. started to come to this place where I had a really hard time leaving my house. I would often find myself curled up in a ball, lying on a pile of shoes in my closet, sobbing. Interesting. And that was how I spent a lot of time. Were the shoes and I went fe- like did they feel good to you? I'm just kind of curious. I Maybe think I it should was try it. <laughs> dark and small. Sure. <laughs> you know, sure. it was like go to the place that it feels as um, manageable and uh, not overwhelming as possible. And so shoving myself in a dark corner was was the most comfort I could find at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's when I really looked at, okay, I, I'm in this film industry that I have been in. You know, by this point I was about 22. 
uh, been in this film industry uh, since I was four. It's been the only life I have ever known. I grew up on film sets. I really didn't go to school. I didn't graduate from high school. I did not have any of that normalcy. Mm -hmm. um, and my normal was this very odd world of, um, you know, superficiality and misogyny and competition and mm -hmm. all of the really difficult, painful, awful things about the film industry were, were becoming much more prominent in my 20s than they were when I was 12, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, so I realized that, you know, I, I, I think that all of this is making what, what feels like just unbelievable anxiety and depression and panic, it's making it worse. Um, and I was really starting to think like, I, I don't know that I want to be an actor forever. I don't know that this is what I see for, for myself. I don't know that this is the contribution I want to be making to the world. I don't know that this is the right place for me long-term. Um, you know, acting was just something that kind of happened to me. It was never particularly intentional. I was four and a guy came up to us in a farmer's market and said like, hey, I'm casting a commercial. Do you want to be in it? So it, it, it seemed just ridiculous to me that a random encounter in a farmer's market needed to dictate the rest of my entire life. And so it was at that point that I that I decided to, to leave L.A. And, and try to figure out who I was underneath the actor and try to work with my mental health. I, I, I knew that if I stayed in that situation, um, it was it was going to be a lot harder to, to to look at all the things I really wanted to examine. How hard was it to leave? You know, for me, the decision to leave was actually pretty straightforward and pretty mm -hmm. easy. Mm -hmm. What was incredibly difficult was dealing with everybody else's feelings about it. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm a people pleaser and I wanted to not disappoint people. Everybody mm -hmm. from my agents to managers to, you know, people I had worked with to, um, you know, people who had seen movies and were like, what else are you doing? You know, like, I just didn't want to disappoint anyone. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the reactions I got from people were very much like, you have the golden ticket. You are a working actor in L.A. What the hell do you think you're doing? Unsupportive. Unsupportive. It's true. I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> Excuse my language. <laughs> but if a person comes to you and is like, I am hurting. No, I am dying. I lack purpose in my life. Why would you say, well, go back to the drug because that's the best you're ever going to feel. So just go do that thing. It's right. like, I'm going to OD if I go back to the drug. Like, don't send me down that dark road. I'm coming to you. But that, I guess, I, I guess what happens with us people pleasers is that we have to consider the source, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times it's, it's from people who have a certain image of what the film industry is, a certain of image of what they want for their lives and maybe have not accomplished. You know, every, it, all of that is coming from, from a particular lens. And, you know, I do think that culturally we have just built up filmmaking and and actors to this ridiculous extent where it, it's hard for people to understand that it is a job mm -hmm. and you know I, I i did the thing that people do when they think about leaving their job i took a piece of paper i put a line down the middle i had pros on one side and cons on the other right what were your and, pros and i'm so curious is it in your book <laughs> my okay so my pros there were two pros one i love the sense of community you have on set yeah i love that feeling of mm -hmm. of camaraderie and connection well and the may i interject one? that when yes. you grow up that way that is your 
identity in terms of your family structure. So like your nuclear definition of family is whoever's playing your dad and mom and like you sort of adopt and I know from I know from experience and I know you know from experience that we did have these like sort of family dynamics in um, certain sets. And it's hard to let go of those. And, 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 and for good reason. It's like most of the time experiences are pretty positive when you're a people pleaser too. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, that, that, that community is m- community with a very big capital C. <laughs> should be yes. like family. Okay. Yes. And, and it's very interesting because I feel like that we'll talk. Let's talk more about that later because I feel like that impacts like what I do now is that search to replace that feeling Please. of that whole thing. Um, the second one, travel. I loved traveling. I loved being able to um, go and live in Rome for four months while we filmed. Like, you know, that that opportunity was something that was very precious to me. And you get paid Those for were it. The two things. You get paid right. and you get a stipend so that you can buy shoes and do the things and have the fun. And you've got a sense yeah. of security if you're traveling. So you know that you have that privilege and, and you're like, do I want to leave this privilege behind? It's not just the mm-hmm. travel itself. It's the, the, mm-hmm. the, the type of travel that you're doing. Yeah. And the opportunity to be somewhere for a length of time that you feel like a local, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're not just going and doing the touristy things. You, you have an apartment, you know, you're not living in a hotel, you have, you know, and you have mm-hmm. the grocery store that you go to and, you know, all of those sorts of things. And so that, that was something that, that I really enjoyed about it. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Cons. But that was it. (laughs) I'm like, that's really two is not much. Yeah. Yeah. And then the cons were um, just, I mean, all the rest of it, the, 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 the lifestyle, the, the challenges of having a meaningful relationship with a partner. If you are, you know, jetting off and and going and, and, and working in these intense situations for a long time. Um, the, 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 the public side of it, I always really struggled with. Um, I had a really hard time being recognized, being out in public that, that always, um, felt really uncomfortable to me. I I watched Sally Field deal with it. The woman, I mean, she's an angel anyway, but she is a master. Like she is just so good at, at dealing with the public and at being recognized. And I mean, she's just amazing at it. Mm-hmm. And me, I'm, I, I, I'm just like this really nervous octopus. Like I don't know what to do with my arms and I'm uncomfortable. And it's just, um, it's really, I, I always found that to be really hard. So that mm-hmm. lack of privacy, um, I, I, I just couldn't see myself dealing with for, for the rest of my life. Along with a lot of, you know, the the very negative things that we we now know a lot about from the from the film industry. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's not great. And it is it is interesting that when you come of age in Hollywood as a female, you're it's very different. Um, I feel like the the men in Hollywood get a lot more free passes at bad behavior. Um, a lot of excuses, a lot less accountability, just traditionally, they also Mm -hmm. get, there's, I I don't know if there's less of them, but when we were coming up, it was always like, well, yeah, you know, the guys don't have to be as talented as the girls because there's more opportunities for them. It's, it's less competitive. And I guess it was, that was, that was, that was the, that was the narrative. I'm not sure if that's true, but, um, but everyone wants to be famous these days. So I'm not sure if that's the same. Um, okay, so then, so then now the cons, like you were saying, it's everything else. Mm-hmm. You're staring at the the list, and then you decide what it, that you. Where did you go after after LA? Did you stay in California or? I didn't. I I knew that I needed to just remove myself. I felt like if I stayed in California, it would be too tempting, right? You said, you know, going, going back to the drug. Uh And I was like, yeah, I need to, I need to distance myself. And so I had been dating this guy for maybe about three months. And I was like, I need to get out of LA. I am done. And he had moved to Virginia and was going to business school. And I was like, 
all right, this is a very new relationship. I have no idea if this is going to work out, but I think he would let me live with him. Like, I'm pretty sure that he would say, okay. <laughs> he won't throw me out of bed. <laughs> he won't throw me out of bed. So I'm kind of like, hey, boyfriend of three months, I'm, I'm moving to Virginia. Um, it worked out. We've now been married like 18 years. Um, so ended up being a good decision. But um, yeah, it was... It, it, I really just needed to put as much space between myself and Los Angeles as I could. And Virginia seemed both culturally and geographically as far away as I could get. And it was, um, it was a terrifying decision and, and a really, really good one. You know, it's so interesting how people are placed in our lives. I don't know if it's like serendipitous or whatnot. I met my husband, um, at probably one of the lowest points of my life, um, mm. gone back to college um, and sort of just, qu- I thought I quit acting too, by the way, but I mm-hmm. I thought, but um, it was just sort of out of my hands. I kind of rebelled in a bigger way that went that time. So I was 26 and really just didn't know <laughs> what was going to happen to me in any regard. Um, so, and I was, I was actively drinking at the time. Anyway, so yeah. I, I was in school and then all of a sudden in a screenwriting class, I see this really handsome guy and I'm like, wow, this guy's really cute. He's way out of my league. I don't have any self-worth at the time. And so <laughs> he, he, um, he compliments a script that I, that I wrote in screenwriting mm-hmm. and I'm like immediately just so taken and I, I, I figure out how to flirt with him. So, so we started dating and we were also engaged within six months, but we have now been together almost 12 years. So I just find it kind of interesting because he does also truly have his own unique story, which I'm sure your husband does to be able to support you (laughs) and you know what I mean? And like track your growth over those years. It's almost like I want to pat our partners on the back for being a part of this journey it's like they're kind of like the the invisible laborer in the room (laughs) yeah and it's fascinating with jeremy too because he and i were friends for five years before we started dating so he really sort of i mean he knew me and we were friends when i was you know in the acting thing when that was you know, very much my, my life. Mm -hmm. And then he's seen me gone, having gone through this, this transformation of realizing this is not something I can do anymore. And then figuring out what's next and, and having left LA and, and gone through this kind of reinvention of, okay, what do you do at 22 when you've already had an 18 year career that you've retired from? It's terrifying. terrifying and terrifying you know who, who I can relate no to you education <laughs> no <laughs> education no skills other than like i can do accents and cry on cue you could be a and, pickpocket and <laughs> i should have tried that maybe it's should, not too late for me maybe not i think you're too good of a person <laughs> And I have quick oh hands. God, that's amazing. Yeah. I love it. I can work on it. Okay. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, figuring out like what happens next and, and, you know, that took a really long time, you know, and I oh. never thought I'd actually figure it out. And there he is standing with like total confidence in me that I'm going to figure it out. Um, you know, and it took like a decade to figure out that that I was a writer and a teacher and a speaker, and you know, I now have this nonprofit and all of these things. And mm-hmm. now he gets to be like, "Yeah, see, I told you, I knew it was all gonna work out." <laughs> I'm like, "God damn you, people who don't have anxiety! What does that feel like for you?" I know it is, and and if you don't mind, I just want to chat about the partner aspect of this because so often we talk so much about and you know what we were talking about getting back to too um but i'm curious like about the partnership of you guys like how has that been for him because i know it's been really hard for my husband to see this not as a linear path so mm-hmm. how has he been able to support you and i guess anyone else listening too who's got who is a partner <laughs> who's really frustrated with their person 
um, or can go back and tell their person like, here, like this is, you know, there's a path for us. This isn't just, yeah. oh, this is messy. Goodbye. You know? Yes. Yes. So I actually did a podcast interview on this topic with Jeremy because I was so curious to know how he deals with me. And so like we, we, we sat down and talked about it. So um, it, it, for anyone who, who wants to listen to it, um, so my podcast is Embrace Your Weird. And I think it's the last episode of the first season. Um, and so we had this whole discussion about it. And um, first of all, so much of what came out in that podcast was news to me about the way that he thinks about um, our relationship and the way that he thinks about my anxiety. And I think the thing that came up that was, I think, the most interesting and the, the most helpful was he talked about realizing that it's not his job to fix me. Mm -hmm. He's like, I had to realize it's not like you're a broken refrigerator and I need to like come in and save the day. He said, I just need to listen and ask you what you need and you might know and you might not know and that's okay too. But it's all about just being there, showing up for you, and listening and supporting in the ways that I can, but realizing that you're not asking me to fix the situation or fix you. I want to say that it's a lot of men that think this way, but the more I unpack it, it's actually all of us who are in relationships with people who are struggling to have answers and yeah. that other person is like well we can get through this we can fix this on my timeline yeah. a lot of people that I like I think people get caught up in I can only contribute so much to this person's struggle when it's so much easier and sustainable I should say for that person to understand the best way to advocate is to be the village, right? To be a, a member of the village, not necessarily the entire village, right? Because yes. even like I'll be talking to my husband about, you know, these these new layers of me understanding myself that I, I, I'm so, I look up to you so much in your understanding of yourself because I'm really starting to peel this back in the interest of writing a memoir myself. And Amazing. so, <laughs> thank you. But in peeling back these layers, it's like I've always told people I'm like an onion. And my husband's like, that's horrible, you know, for that just, just burn hot like me. <laughs> I'm like, babe, but we are getting to this place where he's coming to understand this exact thing. I almost feel like they should chat. <laughs> they should chat. We'll get them together. They need each other too. Right. Exactly. Yes, they need they each do. other. Oh man, that's really great. Thank you. That's a really great, I want to listen to that podcast. So, and where can we find that podcast? That is in all the usual places, um, okay. but you can get uh, a link to that if you go to hellolisajacob.com. I have a link to the podcast there. So Okay, so now when, when did you decide to start making this like your, life's, your life? This is your brand. This is sort of like how you've taken back, I'm sure, a lot of your agency with the struggle how how what was that journey like once you were in virginia for a bit of time yeah so i you know i i i, I did the work i did a lot of work <laughs> i did therapy i mm -hmm. um you know started a meditation practice i um you know made made that a really kind of primary way of 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 dealing with with my monkey mind as we as we call it did um, you try uh, antidepressants is that something i that... never did the medication i was okay. uh, prescribed medication okay. and that was huge for me like i felt such recognition like i felt like seen when i was prescribed meds i was like Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that something is like legit going on, that this is wow. this is real. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
I realized I didn't actually need to take it. <laughs> like I just needed to have it. I needed to know that was a possibility for me. Um, but I wanted to see what other ways were available. I tend to be a person that like reacts ridiculously to like caffeine and sugar. So sure. I was, I was really wanting to see if I could find other ways, um, of, of coping. Yeah. Knowing that I had this, that I could, that I could use as well as, as a tool. Okay. So, um, I, I had this meditation practice that I started doing every day. I started a yoga practice and that kind of cracked the world open for me. Meditation was like one level of amazing. And then once I learned how to combine it with yoga, with kind of the physical aspect with, with the movement, that changed everything for me. And then after doing those practices for a while, I, I saw people around me who were struggling with so many of the same things that I was struggling with. And I was just like, oh my God, I feel like I have this secret. I feel like I have these tools that I have had all of these amazing teachers and instructors and, and mm. therapists who have taught me all of these things. And I feel like I'm hoarding it. Like I feel like I want to be able to share this, share my experience with other people, not in trying to fix them, but just saying like, oh, hi, um, this is amazing. You might want to check it out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, when I wrote my first book that was mostly about uh, growing up in the film industry and making that transition out, I did talk about having anxiety in that book. And when I did the book tour, that was all people wanted to talk about. Like, they didn't care about the acting. They're like, we want to hear about the anxiety because I have anxiety. I don't know what to do about it. Can we talk about that? Wow. And so, yeah. That's really fascinating because even th today, it seems like people always want the tea. They always want the, the algorithm. It's like, you know, so it's it must be so rewarding to connect with other people in a very human way rather than the yes. branded famous way like we were talking about yeah. in the beginning absolutely and so i was like okay i have the topic for my second book and then you know with the second book i i, I really delved into the topics of anxiety trauma depression panic um, and interviewed a lot of other people about what their experiences were with with mm -hmm. all of these issues and it was that that thing that you were talking about earlier of not only did I realize that I could perhaps help other people with the difficulties that they're going through, but I felt such immense comfort in realizing I wasn't alone with this. And so it it, it was helping me, you know, it's it was that really community, helping me. right? With it's the community? the community piece. It's the community piece. So that is really where that came from in terms of like, okay, so I want to become a therapeutically focused yoga teacher. I want to learn how to teach meditation. I want to teach people how to do therapeutic writing practices. I want to work with people who have trauma that led me to working with veterans who have post-traumatic stress. And, you know, it just kind of all unfolded in, in this way that, that I still find shocking to look back on. But but also I'm like, oh, yeah, that's exactly the way it needed to happen. I think so, only because how can... I mean, I'm sure there are people who have been born unproblematic um, and have figured out a way to maybe perhaps teach people to be that way themselves. But nine times out of ten, the people who are going to help you get through shit are the people who have been through shit themselves. <laughs> 100%. Because, and that was one of the things I realized when I looked at um, a lot of the information that was out there about mental wellness, a lot of what I was seeing was very clinical and it was mm. coming from doctors and, 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 and psychiatrists and psychologists and that is all awesome and important. But what I was missing was this piece of 
Okay, I get panic attacks and they suck. And so here are some ways that I have found to be really helpful in getting through them, right? Like it's right. that place of let's relate on this one-to-one -one human level rather than I am up here and I'm going to tell you down here patient. how you should deal with your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doctor to patient mentality. I think that's why TikTok is working so well in the mental health space too, because it's very much one to one. Um, I don't know if you've you do you use it? I think I feel like I've seen something that you've done, but I'm not sure if it's been Instagram oh, or TikTok. Uh, yeah, I'm more on Instagram. I am yeah. I am dipping a toe in I, into TikTok. I will tell you that TikTok could really use someone like you because there's a lot of unqualified people that really share their pain and in hopes that it is seen by other people and and it and it's a very muddled section mm -hmm. of this algorithm you know um so some of it can be i don't want to say misinformation because it's that person's struggle but i do think it can be a little bit more like the trauma porn aspect of 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 all of it you right. know right right so yeah, having people qualify, yeah. So please, you know, <laughs> you can even look up if you look if you look up um, the hashtag. That's something that you you can do when you when you, when you launch the app. It's not technically what you're meant to do, but you can do that. That way, you can filter understanding what's out there in terms of that content. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I just think like a voice like yours is is would be so welcomed by that community. So that's just a side oh, note. Thank you. That's a sign. All right. And I'll, I'll put follow it on my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? You're like, oh, God, it's going to give me anxiety. You know, I wanted to talk to you. You mentioned something a couple times. Um, I've had stage fright, debilitating, <sighs> debilitating stage fright, so much so that I have quit, pretty much quit and avoided performing live for years. Yeah. And I yeah. started in theater. Like, that's how I started. And right. While I'm while I'm starting to do more of the trauma informed, like you know, childhood work and what everything, I am interested in this this topic as a whole. And you had mentioned that you you know your first anxiety attack kicked in when you had the live audience, and just in general that performative nature. Um, and but then cut to you're doing this like TED Talk type thing on YouTube, and no. I look at you and I'm like, look at her. I could never just do that, bare my soul like that in live without stumbling and freaking out and, you know, just pooping my pants. Like, I can't. <laughs> How do you do that? Um, you stumble and you freak out and you hopefully don't poop your pants. Yeah. But the stumbling and the freaking out, that, that's just going to happen. Yeah, it is absolutely ridiculous that I do what I do because it is definitely anxiety provoking for me. I mean, I feel like it's just the universe like looking down, kind of going, <laughs> look at you, you thought you could get away from it. Um, and so that is uh, definitely a thing. But one of those things I think um, that has been interesting for me is that I work with people on how to face their anxiety and be vulnerable in the face of it and do the things that they want to do in spite of it, right? And so it seems only fair that I should put some skin in the game, right? And really kind of walk the walk that way. And that I am also making myself vulnerable, that I am also doing the things that feel scary. And what I have found is that when I can get deeply, deeply rooted in the purpose of what I'm doing, that makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. So I am not you know, going and doing these speaking events in front of massive groups of people because I want to stand up there and be like, hey, look at me. Look, of course here not. I am. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. That's not what it's about. It is about talking about topics that I am deeply passionate about, topics that I feel like we are not talking enough about, topics that I feel like can actually 
really shift things in an important way for people. And so when I can get grounded in that purpose, it makes me less self-conscious because it's like, I'm not up here just talking about myself. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about how we can potentially experience just a little less suffering in our lives. And that makes my own discomfort worth it. So we talk a lot about control in some way. I wouldn't call it like the control that one would think, but I'm saying like containment, living with, you know, that sort of mentality of like, our our lives are by our own design. And, and so much of that is rewarding. At the same time, it's also very... Um, challenging and so like you were saying you're you're constantly putting yourself out there to find a deeper rooting to the purpose it sounds exhausting and so yes. i'm following up with okay you can see where i'm going with this how do you decompress in a healthy way because so many people like us have decompressed in ways that have been very negative. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about yourself. For me, it was alcohol. It was, mm -hmm. um, you know, dating and, and all sorts of stuff. So it's like, how do you, how do you stay on your path, but truly feel like you've connected the balance in one way with work and mm -hmm. then the other way with love and being present for your partner and family and all that. Yeah. So that, I mean, that gets into the topic of boundaries, which is just a topic that we could go on for days about, right? Because that whole idea of having boundaries to, to feel safe and protect yourself, like from myself, honestly, like most of my boundaries are to protect myself from myself. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out where those boundaries are. Um, for me, like I'm a really big fan of the four day work week. Like I do the best that I can to not work on Fridays. And that is something that um, is, is very hard sometimes, right? And, and, and very hard to say no to things and say no to people and, and to carve out that time. But I feel like when I was in LA, I really lost this sense. I don't know if I ever had this sense because it's it's hard to have a sense of who you are when you're younger than four. You know, I always defined myself as an actor before I defined myself as anything else. Mm -hmm. And so now, um, even though I'm, I'm so much more passionate about my work, I feel like I'm still at risk of, only defining myself by my work. And so being able to, you know, confine myself to a four day work week gives me the space to remember like, oh, I'm actually a human being outside of the work that I do. And because there's so much emotional labor involved in working with, with folks with their mental wellness, I, I need that time. You yes. know, I definitely need that time. So, you know, taking it really seriously about, and I, you know, I think this goes for, for so many people, taking it really seriously of having a time that I don't look at my phone after, you know, a certain time in the evenings. I don't check emails, you know, at this point. I try not to pick up my phone and, and, and scroll first thing in the morning. I, I try to do my meditation practice first, you know, Self -care. all of those little things that I think, um, if you're not doing them and if you're not taking them seriously, it, it really does just, just burn, burn you out, which is a, a really terrible state to live in. Yeah. So it's all about good habits after all, isn't it? This is what yeah. my husband's trying to tell me. And he's recently <laughs> lost like 20, 30 pounds, like in the last like wow. couple months. Yeah. And he's like, look, if I can change my physical state, I have faith that you can change some of your mental state um, in terms of it, understanding it better and being more consistent. And I think it is, you know, um, it is these habits that I hear you talking about that even if you're decompressing, they are still habits 
that are formed in doing these things and end up being good for you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Absolutely. That's awesome. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, this massive commitment. I talk to people about that a lot who are maybe wanting to start a yoga practice or a meditation practice and they're worried about time and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, I started this online yoga company called Blue Mala and, and I have like five and 10 minute yoga videos for free up on there. I'm going to And it's like, them. <laughs> do five or 10 minutes of yoga. Like that is a big deal. You know, you don't have to go to a 90 minute yoga class, right? You can do three minutes of breathing exercises, which I also have over at Blue Model. I'm really trying to make it as easy as possible to, to get this stuff, right? Yeah. And it's like taking just those couple of minutes on a daily basis that adds up. And it really can help to just sort of shift the trajectory of, of where your mental health is heading that day. And then I think once you prove it to yourself enough, it becomes a habit worth keeping, right? When you see that transactionally, which is generally how I've operated since I was in the business at such a young age, it's like, oh, this is in my best interest. Okay, well, I'm going to do it again then. Absolutely. So Blue yeah. Mala, can we talk about Blue Mala? Like when did that launch? Sure. Obviously you've got the two books and we can get those online, but yes. Are, so are you, Blue, yeah. Blue Mala is something that I started, uh, thank you COVID, because I was teaching workshops about yoga and meditation and traveling and doing all of that. And then of course, when the world came to a halt, I, I really wanted to keep offering this stuff. And what's amazing about it is that actually for the folks I, I work with, it makes total sense to have online programming because I'm working with people who maybe are too anxious to walk into a yoga studio, which I totally understand. And so I teach live yoga and meditation classes every week. Um, there is a library of past recorded classes. So if the timings don't work for you, there are hundreds of classes there that you can take on demand. And it was really important to me because I feel like a lot of, of mental health can feel inaccessible. And I know people are really struggling financially right now. So it's all pay what you can. Oh, that's so amazing. So it is a pay what you can monthly membership. Oh, and then wow. you get unlimited access to to the classes, to live classes. We mm -hmm. have um, a, an online community so you can meet the other members. Um, oh, we have great. office hours where we just all get together on Zoom and just like chat about our week and what's going on. So it's it's almost like group therapy, except there's no therapist. We're just all there supporting one another. It's like a community. It's a community. That's awesome. Blue yeah. Mala, bluemala.com, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm going to check yeah. it out. I love and Please I think there's do. something we'd love to have you. But there's something great about honestly the pay what you can model because it makes you want to pay more. It's like this is this is that's really fantastic. I love that. <laughs> Personally. Thank you. It, it was um yeah, everybody told me not to do it that way. Um, <laughs> and has it proven like, to be successful, make... though? It actually has. People are good-hearted. People are good-hearted it... in a way mm -hmm. that, yes. And, and, and um, yeah. But, like, so many people make money off people's suffering, and they're hip oh. to it. They're hip to it. They're hip to rehabs, hooking people on drugs again so that they have beds to fill. They're hip yes. to these, you know, pharmaceutical companies and they're and they're jaded about it but at the same time they're looking for the communities that are the that exact thing thank you so much for offering that to people and people please go check that out because that just sounds amazing and also i would be remiss if we didn't mention mission flexible because you know yes. my husband is a former marine he's an iraq That's veteran right <laughs> yeah so amazing could you please tell me about that so I started working with veterans in 2016. I was invited to go to a mindfulness retreat for vets, and I did not know what I was doing at all. I was so nervous. I, I, 
I don't think I'd ever talked to a veteran. Like I, I didn't come from a military family. I had no clue what I was doing. I had just been invited because of my, my work with civilians with anxiety and depression. And I went on this retreat um, and the vets um, gave me total shit. They gave me of they such did. a hard time. Of course they did. That was <laughs> And I was like, I have to earn my right to be here and I get it. And within a couple of days, uh, apparently I, I, I did that successfully. And I just realized like this is this is my new thing. This is something that is so important to me. And I realized um, one of the first uh, things that that one of the vets was talking to me about was she said something to me about like, well, okay, so you used to be an actor and yeah, 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 what, what do you miss about it? And I started talking about that feeling that you get on set, that feeling of, of community, that feeling of being with a group of people and you're you're working on something together and you're you're living and you're working in close quarters and there's just no life that exists outside of that. And then it's really hard because when that shoot is over, you all kind of disperse and it's it, it feels really discombobulating and it, it's challenging. And she said, you just described deployment. Absolutely. That is so similar to how we feel and how a lot of us feel when we get out you know after our time in service we've lost this this family that we had and i was so amazed that we had that kind of common language that we had that common experience in two very different seeming worlds and so that sort of hooked me and i was like this this creation of of camaraderie of a family is what i've been missing and what they've been missing and so i really loved working with veterans and just love and respect the community so much that i i eventually started my own nonprofit, and that's mission flexible and so we run mindfulness retreats so yoga and meditation retreats four days three nights um we do this all over the country it's completely free for veterans and we go hiking and canoeing and we play paintball and we do zip lines and we do therapeutic writing and we sit around bonfires and like talk about the important things of life and it's just it's amazing that is amazing oh my gosh yeah. and honestly i could Thank talk you. to you forever and ever but I would have to pay you for your time because you're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> you're priceless. So and I really can't wait. I want, I, if I bring you a book, will you sign it for me? 100%. It, it will be highlighted. It will be tabbed. It will be dog-eared. We will unpack more and more of all of this stuff. But honestly, this has been such a joy to chat with you. And I don't know if you know this, but you know, I think I may have mentioned it to you in the past. But something that I want to do is, you know, advocate for child actors in general. Yeah. Mara Wilson has been a part of that uh, dialogue. It's a growing number of people. And it, it is, if you're interested, I would love to kind of keep you updated with what I'm doing and kind of, you know, let you know as we go with those conversations that are being had. I know there's another podcast. Sign me up. Okay, good. There's another podcast. Allison Stoner, who's a friend of our pod and myself. Yeah. She's she's launching something, I think, at some point. I don't want to say too many details, but she's 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 doing something big too. And and what I love about your your books and in leaning into your past, um, is that those are stories because we don't have a ton of data. I go back to the data when it comes to the underrepresentation of minors in, you know, the industry. And yeah. when we have that data, it will be so revealing and I think so cathartic for all of us that are still alive, remembering our childhoods and saying, look at how these statistics are proving this. Even though it seems like, well, we all know nudge, nudge, that it's hard to be a child actor. It's like, no, this is the data that Stanford University yeah. funded, and this is what it is. So now you know, and now we can do legislation, and now we can have, you know, it's it's not whistleblowing, which I think so many productions and probably networks are like, whoa, 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 let's not stir the pot. It's not about blacklisting those who are trying to advocate for literally children. 
Um, it's more or less like, how do we make things better for everyone? Yes, absolutely. So. Well, it really is the the only industry that we have decided it it is okay for children to work in. And so I think, <laughs> right? Give like, me your childhood. Here's millions of dollars. But like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, that's yeah. basically what we're saying without saying it. Um, yeah. They're like, well, you'll get so much privilege. What you do with that privilege is up to you, but we won't give you any mentorship programs. We won't give you any support. If your parents take your money, that's that's on you with the genetic uh, lottery that you got. So so really, yeah. I, I, I feel called as you felt that calling. Um, and so I'm called to that. And I'm probably sounding like a broken record, but... I don't care, you know, like this is my podcast and we're vulnerable here. So thank you so much, so much for your time. I love you. <laughs> I love you. This okay, has been cool. so wonderful, honestly. And you look amazing um, and I love your books oh, and I need you. books in this house now. <laughs> you just moved in, you'll get settled. Oh my gosh. So Lisa, amazing. then where can we find you with your handle? So we got Blue Mala. Yes, you can find me bluemala.com. You can find me on Instagram. I am on Twitter. Um, I, I might need to be on TikTok now, apparently. Yes. So I'll I'm get that recruiting. set up. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. And then my my nonprofit for veterans who are dealing with trauma, that is at missionflexible.org. So information about that is over there too. So lots Thank of places you. to find me. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been an absolute delight. <laughs>